Welcome to FutureX, the podcast where we look to solve the variable that is the future of Web3. Every week, we'll talk with some of the brightest minds in the blockchain and Web3 space, from top investors to founders and builders, paving the way for a decentralized world. So what is the future of blockchain? What will Web3 look like in 2050? Let's explore together. Hey, Nate. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, let's start by giving us a quick background on yourself and how you broke into the Web3 space. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Nate Hamilton. I, I help lead ecosystem uh, for Moonbeam. Uh, a company I work for is called PureStake. Um, we've been around for about four years now. Uh, we do a variety uh, of things in the crypto space. We, we run nodes for different blockchains, um, things along those lines on like the, the DevOps and infrastructure side. But uh, more, probably most notably, we're one of the core uh, developing teams uh, for the Moonbeam project. Um, and so uh, I, uh, yeah, so I, I ended up kind of being in Web2 sales for, I don't know, it was like eight years or so. And um, I was honestly kind of bored with what I was doing and, and what I was a product I was selling. It was a pretty mature market, pretty mature product. I didn't feel like there was a ton of opportunity for growth or that I wasn't really learning a whole lot. Um, and so I started looking around in like 2017, 18 um, to, to kind of understand, um, you know, what else was out there and met with a couple of old bosses, old CEOs, a couple of mentors. Um, and one of them specifically was like, you should look at crypto. Uh, and I, I laughed because at the time I, I was like, what the hell am I going to do in crypto? Uh, and um so uh, long story short, ended up running into an old co-founder at a, a Boston crypto event. Um, and he was doing a new startup, which was PureStake. Uh, I was really more focused on like validators and, and things along those lines. Um, and so he asked me if I wanted to kind of make the jump and see what we could do and see if we could uh, we could make a go in this crypto thing. And so uh, four, four or so years later, here we are. So 2000, 2018, 2019, that must have been during the bear market, right? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty quiet. Um, it was definitely before anything kind of picked up. It was way before DeFi summer of 2020. And then obviously the chaos that ensued in 2021. And so it was actually like, it was a, it was a pretty cool time to come into the space because it wasn't. You know, I think the ICO bubble had popped a year or so prior. And, you know, I think that everyone was kind of like stumbling around looking for like, what the hell just happened and what are we going to do? You know, what, what what's going to be the thing that moves the space forward? And, you know, is this real? Is this not real? But um, the thing that, the thing that kind of uh, caught me was some of the new L1s that were coming to market that, uh, you know, it was, it was here in Boston, Algorand uh, was one of the, the notable teams. And that was where we kind of got our first start was Algorand. Um, but yeah, there was, there was Algorand, there was Solana, there was Avax, there was Hedera, there was Polkadot. And so there were these new ecosystems kind of bubbling out of, you know, the Ethereum, you know, space and trying to do it better, faster, more scalable. And so, um, yeah, it was it was an interesting time to kind of be there because there, these narratives were really starting to form. And uh, some of them have been proven true. Some of them have proved, been proven not true. Uh, but it, it was definitely... Um, an interesting time to join because it was very much like a build market. It it wasn't one where people were just you know out there you know shilling and making a ton of money. It was very much a, a time to 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 try and build some cool tech and and try and you know uh, align with things that that you you felt were going to be impactful kind of for the future. That's great. Yeah, having been through like one builder market yourself already, uh, what do you think about this current market? You know, I, I think everyone's saying this is the time to build. You know, the markets are moving relatively sideways. Do you see some similarities from 2019 and today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think that um, I think that there's one of the big differences is is that DeFi really hadn't kicked off then, and so I think I'm almost more encouraged because at that point it was really like. Uh, the narrative had shifted to like blockchain, not Bitcoin. And it was like, you know, this blockchain tech. And so you'd seen all these like uh, enterprise issues cases or like private blockchain spin up in like 2016, 17, 18 with like IBM and R3, Corda and stuff that, I don't know, it, it never really felt like that was going to be the thing that propelled the space forward. Whereas I think 
I though though it got too hot in 2021 and you know all the chaos that ensued in 2022 with things kind of you know blowing themselves up the the common thread to me there was that the things that all blew up were not DeFi they they may have they may have uh, DeFi may have helped fuel their blowups but it was ultimately people and greed at, at least in my estimation is my opinion obviously uh, that that really were the, the huge blowups and, and in some cases fraud uh, that that were the blowups and that if you look at the like ethos of DeFi I think that has product market fit that has found that like wow this DeFi thing you know it actually works it, it doesn't allow people to you know borrow more than they should be able to it doesn't allow people to not get liquidated uh, assuming that it's not you know uh, a, a three letter letter exchange that's like not liquidating their own you know their own stuff um, and so like to me I'm actually more encouraged even though sometimes it can be really hard to stay you know positive when you know, the world can be burning around you sometimes. I think like DeFi has found that product market fit in 21 into 2010, 22. And, and right now there's still some really cool stuff being built. And so I think this, this like consolidation and this kind of blow up will ultimately kind of, uh, it's almost like the charring of the forest floor that new things will start to sp sprout out of that. Um, and, and I think the fact that DeFi is here to stay and it's kind of proved itself, that's just one use case that I think has finally found product market fit in crypto. And now you're going to start to see that expand as well as, you know, obviously NFTs and some cool, cool use cases around that. I do still think that there's a fit for, you know, more like Web2 and or, you know, brands, retail to come into the space in some some ways. So I am super, you know, super excited about uh, about 2023 into into the future and what's uh, what's going to come from from some of the, uh, the chaos that's ensued the past two years. That's great to hear. Yeah, I think, you know, to your point, what we saw over the last year is just the failure of centralized system that, if anything, it's further cemented the value propositions of DeFi, right? So uh, I think we share the same sentiment, super bullish on decentralized systems in general going forward. And I agree with you, very different, you know, landscape from 2019. We have a lot more depths in the market. We have a lot more actual users who are, you know, doing everything from GameFi to DeFi to, to you know, everything in between. So you're a few years in now in the Web3 say, space. What would you say are some of the things you love and maybe that, you know, you're not so crazy about in in Web3 versus like the Web2 world? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's... Uh... It's very much a love and hate relationship in in many ways. I uh, I absolutely love um, you know some of the chaos that that you know comes from just being in Web three like the three like daily just kind of waking up and like looking at crypto Twitter and seeing you know what blew up or what got hacked like that's that's it's exciting but at the same time you know those are the things that you know they keep you up at night they give you heartburn to think about like what's what's kind of next is something in, and, you know, movie ecosystem going to happen or, you know, whatever. Um, so there is like, there, there's a love hate relationship with the chaos and the ecosystem um, or in crypto in general. Um, I also, I, I love, I love the flexibility in terms of, uh, you know, anybody can participate. Right. So if you look at folks who might be like ambassadors for Moonbeam, um, there are people all over the world, all different backgrounds. You don't have to have some, you know, specific degree to be able to get, you know, uh, to get into the ecosystem, to be a participant, to, you know, maybe start a project at some point. It's just, it, it's like this great equalizer where uh, it, it allows folks from all walks of life uh, to be able to kind of chart their own course and destiny. You don't have to look a specific way you don't have to go to a specific university you don't have to have some degree if you're you know um if you're enthusiastic you work hard you kind of find uh, find you know a group of people or an ecosystem or a product that you think might have uh, have a fit generally you know you can go and try and execute on that which is is super cool um the you know the the one of the one of the hardest things to balance is is kind of a work work life balance uh and it's it's harder than anywhere else i've ever worked before i mean i i had to travel some for for my past role and i was in tech sales like i mentioned and um but but generally you could kind of 
you know, shut the laptop end of the day, kind of walk away. And it was, it was what it was. Um, or even, you know, weekends, not, not even like thinking about where in, in crypto, it just doesn't stop. And so, you know, trying to disconnect, uh, you know, at nights to see, you know, I have two little kids with a third on the way, trying to see my kids and spend time with them, see my wife. Um, and while at the same time, knowing that I could probably work all day, every day, seven days a week and still have more work, you know, coming to me um, is, is really hard to balance. And so uh, that's, that's, that's one of the things that whether I love it or hate it, I, I love it in that it's just so fa fast paced. Sometimes you do hate it where you're like, I just want to disconnect for a little bit. I need to recharge. And you don't really get the ability to, to kind of check out too often. Um, and so that can be, that can be certainly difficult sometimes. I think that Web3 has this like always on culture, right? Is it because the markets, you know, don't close? Is it because teams are generally globally distributed? So we have to accommodate multiple time zones. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a culmination of all of that. Right. So, you know, when there's, uh, uh, when, I mean, look at wall street, wall street has specific hours that it's open and then it's closed. There's nothing you can do now. There's obviously, you know, there's, uh, there's wall street, but then there's London stock exchange and, and then, you know, the Asian markets as well though. So like there is, that is, there are things going kind of around the clock, but in that, in that kind of setup, generally, you know, if you're working for, you know, a big bank or something along those lines, people work those specific kind of um, those specific markets. And um, in crypto, it just like, there is no like set hours, there's no off button. And so absolutely, you know, from like a, just a market perspective, it's always going, but I think you're right that um, it is so globally distributed that, um, you know, it's, you're working with teams. I mean, I'm, I'm outside of Boston and so I'm GMT minus five, but I would say, five days a week, my like 8.30 to noon, one o'clock is stacked because I talked to so many teams in, in Europe. And then uh, towards the end of the day uh, where I try and schedule my day, um, that's when the teams in Asia are, are kind of coming back online. And so I do end up having calls at night um, and, and you know trying to accommodate as, as best I can. But it is one of those things that it, you kind of add all that together and it, it just never stops. And um, you know, you see, you see, uh, I think it was maybe a year, year and a half ago, Coinbase kind of mandated like a week off or like all employees or some, some structure where it was like off. I think that's great if you can do it. And, um, you know, that, that's amazing for a, a company that has, you know, so many employees and has such roots in crypto to kind of push that. It's really freaking hard when it's generally, it's mostly startups teams trying to make their name, teams trying to kind of stake their claim. And it is so like new and innovative that things are changing so quickly that you feel like you're, if you take your eye off the ball, you're, you're going to miss something that does, that does suck sometimes uh, that, you, you know, you, you just, you, you want to take a breath, but sometimes crypto just doesn't, doesn't really embrace that. It's like, no, no, no just keep, keep pushing through. You can't, uh, you can't take that off. And, you know, so for somebody looking to break into, you know, web three, uh, some of the advice would just be like, just be ready that you will, you will probably work harder than you've ever worked before. You will work crazy hours than you've ever worked before. But um, being able to kind of try and set boundaries uh, after a certain time. So I've been, I've been in for four years and Moonbeam has been kind of um, off. It's been live for a year, but we built for about two before. So it's been really three years of, of kind of what I'd call like a real crypto project that we've been that we've been building, and um, it's really hard. Uh, but you just gotta try and set some boundaries. You've gotta try and you know go touch grass. You've gotta try and you know don't forget the things in in real life, friends, family, kids, things like that. That 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 shit really matters. You can very much forget about that quickly, especially when a bull market hits. That um, it's it's really hard, but you need to make sure that you're balancing things out. Yeah, completely agree. Sometimes you got to learn to turn off Twitter, turn off Telegram, and just touch some grass. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's uh, jump into the the actual uh, company, the project, and some of the things you guys are working on. So can you first start by telling us um, or expanding on the relationship between Pure Stake and Moonbeam? 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I touched on it briefly earlier. So, um, you know, uh, Pure Stake, uh, the company, we do a variety of things uh, in the crypto industry. Generally, it's on the DevOps side of things. So we, we provide, you know, node services, validation, uh, APIs, things like that across a couple different ecosystems. Um, but um, one of the projects that, it, like I said, I think earlier was most notable is Moonbeam. Uh, and so we're one of the core developing teams uh, that is supporting Moonbeam and, and kind of help launch Moonbeam is getting it out the door and continuing to to work on and maintain it. And so uh, that's kind of the the relationship there is there's Moonbeam is the decentralized network. Mm-hmm. Peter Stake is is one of the core teams, uh, you know, supporting the development uh, and, and building around Moonbeam. Great. So from my understanding, Moonbeam is an Ethereum compatible smart contract parachain, right? So for those who may not be familiar, can you tell me a little more about what a parachain is and how it fits into this like multi-chain ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's a good question. So um, the if if you if you step back and and try to understand Polkadot a little bit, so Polkadot is a network of interconnected blockchains, and so Polkadot I like to describe as being kind of like a backbone. And so what they do, it, what Polkadot does is. Polkadot has this robust set of validators. I want to say it's 275 or 300 validators who are just validating the blocks on the Polkadot network. Um, When you're a parachain, one of the values of being a parachain is getting shared security from the Polkadot relay chain. And how you do that is you basically lock up a slot to connect to this relay chain, which is Polkadot. And so um, these interconnected blockchains, they call, uh, from a vernacular standpoint, they call parachains. Uh, And it basically just means that you are a layer one blockchain that is getting shared security from the layer zero blockchain, aka Polkadot. Um, So at like the highest level, that is what uh, that is what a parachain, uh, that's what a parachain is. Um, And and so the the kind of goal of Polkadot is, uh, I would say it's kind of following the app chain narrative right now. And Mm -hmm. so um, it's specialized blockchains that are interoperable and can work uh, work together or work kind of across one another to create new decentralized applications. And so the specialty for Moonbeam uh, is that Ethereum compatibility layer. And so uh, obviously, you know, providing the EVM, teams can kind of come deploy and things along those lines using Solidity contracts uh, from Ethereum or Avalanche or BNB, whatever. Um, that's That's one piece of what we do um, or what Moonbeam does, uh, there are a bunch of things that, that, that are being really focused on around interconnectability uh, or interoperability uh, and what we call connected contracts. So uh, the EVM provides us this ability for these teams to deploy, but then internally to Polkadot, there's XCM. So XCM is native message passing between these parachains connected to Polkadot. Uh, but then externally, we've also worked with folks like uh, Axelar, Layer Zero, Wormhole, Hyperlane, uh, Multi-Chain to be able to connect um, outwardly to these other blockchains. And so like, why does that matter? Um, and really what it comes down to is this new you know, theme of message passing. And so bridges in the past were all focused kind of on assets moving you know, one ETH here to there. Uh, and that's fine. But the, the next step in that is being able to say, okay, well, maybe I don't actually have to move those assets. I can use this general message passing framework to just send messages between blockchains. Now, what that opens up is you can fundamentally change the way applications are built to be natively multi-chain so that if you're deployed on, you know, your, your kind of brain is on Moonbeam, you can still touch all of these other ecosystems, whether it's ETH mainnet, whether it's AVAX, whether it's uh, Arbitrum, you're able to kind of touch those and engage those users in a way that you couldn't prior by using this general message or arbitrary message passing, the vernacular changes, depending on which uh, which team you talk to. Um, but that's something that we're, we're really focusing on right now is what we call connected contracts, giving developers the ability to connect into all these other blockchains in a way that they really hadn't before and just enabling kind of new applications to be built uh, around that. Got it. So for a project like ours, we're a decentralized derivatives exchange that's taking a multi-chain approach. We're deployed on Ethereum, Mainnet, Polygon, BNB, Arbitrum, and we're always looking for other ecosystems to break into. How, 
how simple is it for us to, you know, to take our smart contracts and port it over to the Polkadot, to the Polkadot ecosystem using Moonbeam? I mean, that's that's very straightforward. So, you know, we we spent, as I mentioned, before Moonbeam launched, it took about two years of uh, just building. And so one of the big things we focused on was, um, actually two of the big things we focused on was uh, documentation. Uh, and really it's it, well, it's it, in the Web3 sense, it's not customer support, but it's more just developer support. And so um, we've spent a ton of time just working on making sure that our documentation is at as good, if not better than anywhere else in the crypto space. And we believe that making a, a heavy investment in supporting developers would, would pay, you know, pay back uh, in time in terms of projects deploying, because we've just realized that people just, they look for support. They look to try and figure out, well, if something doesn't work, how do I fix it? And so making sure the docs are as tight as possible, but then also having channels with our developer relations team that, hey, this pre-compile isn't working or this, uh, this, you know, uh, uh, this framework isn't, isn't deploying the contracts correctly. Having a team that can actually just go look at that and debug it, look at it, work hand in hand with a developing team, we felt like that was key. And so for somebody like you guys going multi-chain, we've made it really easy for you to kind of take those contracts, deploy and have them, you know, whether you work with Waffle, Truffle, Ganache, you know, one of those other frameworks. You can do that. Uh, all those work really out of the box with Moonbeam. Um, we also have things like um, uh, we have an ether scan deployment called MoonScan. And so all the looks and feels of deploying uh, to some of these other uh, ecosystems, you would have that same kind of tooling uh, available to you on Moonbeam. So it would be very straightforward. Um, and then from there, you can connect with other parachains in the Polkadot ecosystem. You can try and figure out new assets and, and new ways to kind of connect into these other blockchains that are building their own communities, their own products, their own, you know, uh, strategies and things like that. So it, it does give you kind of that optionality to, to connect in very easily to Polkadot. That's great to hear. What is, you know, how closely do you guys work with the Polkadot Foundation? So we work very closely with, uh, so there's, there's kind of two different organizations on the Polkadot side there. So there's the Web3 Foundation uh, and then there's Parity. So the Web3 Foundation uh, manages anything having to do with, uh, I think, the DOT and KSM token. I don't want to misrepresent them, but generally in the foundation setup, they kind of manage that kind of stuff. Um, the other side is Parity. So Parity would be um, analogous to, to what Pure Stake does for Moonbeam. Uh, they're generally one of the main teams uh, that are, are developing the code and the ecosystem for, uh, for Polkadot. And so um, we work probably more closely with the team at Parity because, you know, they have, uh, they're the team developing things. They have an ecosystem um, team uh, focused on bringing in new projects and teams in the ecosystem and connecting projects together. So we work very closely with the team at Parity to, to make sure that uh, what's being built on Moonbeam and also the teams on Moonbeam uh, have, you know, the ability to, to understand what else is coming to kind of Polkadot, what other teams they can connect to, how we can, you know, try and help them make one plus one equal three. Um, so, yeah, we work very closely with that. Um, and what about, what does 2023 look like for Moonbeam and for Pure Stake? Yeah, so... Um, you know, 2023, I think, if it, so based on 2022, I think was was a, a rough year for everyone. Um, yeah, I don't think anyone anyone would say they loved 2022. So uh, I'm excited for 2023 uh, in terms of some of the uh, the new features that, that are kind of coming um, to teams that are building in the ecosystem, but also some of the features Moonbeam uh, itself will, will kind of have. So um, I think that, 2022 was very much a build year for the, the Moonbeam ecosystem, as well as the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, it, it takes a long time to build and make sure that developers have kind of all of the tooling that they're that they're looking for. And so um, we we feel like the ecosystem is finally kind of there to really um, I don't want to say burst, but actually really see more use cases kind of come in and leverage some of the other teams that have been building here for a long time, whether it's some of the DeFi teams who have uh, have built like an amazing kind of what I call like base layer of DeFi and kind of adding on to them could be something with you guys. Um, 
those are some of the things that I'm interested in from an ecosystem standpoint and from a, you know, from a tech standpoint, there's uh, a brand new governance, um, uh, governance V3 is, uh, was deployed by Polkadot. Uh, I think it's on Kusama right now. I think it's coming to Polkadot shortly. That will be something that gets integrated. That's a huge, uh, that's been a huge undertaking. Um, asynchronous backing is a feature that Polkadot is deploying, uh, which is gonna take block, uh, block times on Moonbeam down from 12 seconds to six seconds, which is a huge, uh, a huge improvement. We're really excited for that. Uh, we're working on a variety of initiatives. Uh, there's a new grants program rolling out, which is going to be great to support teams in the ecosystem. Um, there's just like, there's a, a ton of really cool new stuff around uh, pre-compiles and uh, what we call XC assets. So any asset on Moonbeam can basically natively start to be able to move, move into any uh, ecosystem on Polkadot uh, as like in the ERC-20 that that looks it looks like an ERC twenty, but it's a substrate asset kind of under the hood. So there's some really cool like technical features that are being worked on to make Moonbeam even more interoperable with Polkadot internally, but then also externally with uh, with other ecosystems as well. Right. Uh, during this kind of builder market, are there any other unique opportunities that you guys see that you would want to pursue even beyond twenty twenty three? Because I think the general consensus right now is you know, maybe the, the market stays relatively sideways until um, <clears throat> no sooner than 2024, right? So I think we all have plenty of time to build. Are there any other verticals that you guys are considering uh, even at the pure stake level? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think on the, on the, specifically on the Moonbeam side of things, um, we're exploring like what, Will Web 2 users finally come into Web 3 in an experience that they can consume without necessarily knowing it's a blockchain, right? So I think I think that was that was talked a lot about in prior years, but I don't think the tooling and infrastructure to support that was actually there at the time. And so, you know, asking a, uh, you know, a normie to kind of come in, download a wallet, have a mnemonic or a seed phrase, uh, keep that safe, never lose it, uh, and then start interacting with things where you know they they don't they, they don't necessarily it's not a very like intuitive experience from a user perspective. You have to have a relatively high degree of understanding of how these things work to feel confident in working with a lot of the things that have been built uh, in the past. Now, I'm interested to see um, can we break into um, the web two scene where I think that teams have matured and the, the user interfaces have gotten so much better, uh, whether it's custodial wallets or whether it's, you know, non-custodial wallets, but done in a way where the user, you know, doesn't have to really feel or know that it's, it's like a, it's a wallet. It's more of like a, I give the Dapper Labs team a lot of credit with NBA Top Shot, right? It's got its own issues. Don't get me wrong. But when you go to NBA Top Shot and you kind of make an account, you're creating a wallet. You may not know, they don't call it a wallet, they call it a vault. And so, you know, it's like, hey, you save this. I think it's like 20 character little term, like save this. It's not 15 phrases or anything like that. Uh, it's it, it's just a very long kind of string of characters. Save this and you'll need it. Okay, great. But when you go there, you, you don't feel like you're necessarily doing something in crypto. You feel like you're just buying these cool like collectibles that, um, you know, may or may not have value long term. Who knows? But like, if you're an NBA fan, you can get in there relatively easy. You can hook in either bank account or credit card to buy these things and hold on to them in your vault. If you want to sell them, great. There's a marketplace you can go sell them. That's the kind of thing that I'm I'm excited about, and I want to see if if 2023 is the year where applications can really get into mainstream where. A users using a blockchain, but may not really necessarily know or care that it's a blockchain. Uh, so those are some of the the things that I'm I'm really kind of thinking about and looking to talk to teams about uh, that I think could be could be pretty impactful uh, moving forward. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's a great point. I think user the user onboarding right now is is not the best. I mean, some teams like Dever Labs are you know, solving for it. The challenges with that, in my opinion, is it's still like a very centralized experience, right? Um, you know, especially looking at Dapper Labs, I think a user comes in and then they're not able to take their assets off 
the main Dapper Labs platform or the Flow blockchain. And so I think we're making a lot of progress, but you know, we really can't forget that the end goal is decentralization. Yep. Um, so how do we balance, you know, the user experience with, you know, decentralization, right? Totally, totally. And there needs to be uh, that sometimes being like decentralized from the start can can be really hard. And so, uh, but I, I totally agree that there needs to be a way to kind of walk that line of decentralization, but not necessarily exclude, you know, all of these users who don't know how or aren't comfortable kind of getting in. There needs to be, I think that's that's where the, the, the opportunity lies is having decentralized applications uh, and kind of living the crypto ethos of, of decentralization, but making it easier for users to come in. And like I said, maybe it's custodial wallets to start that then you can move them into a non-custodial wallet if you're a you know if you're a web three you know user and you're you're comfortable kind of with your own keys uh, and everything along those lines, but giving some optionality to users where if they're not quite ready to go that route, knowing that you know they don't have to uh, they don't have to worry about that. So there is kind of this line and definitely like a a push and pull around the you know the the crypto ethos, but also enabling more users to come in in a way that. Um, uh, isn't as maybe th th there isn't as much friction. Right. Are there any sectors in particular that you think might be a bit overhyped at the moment? Uh, some that you see fizzling out over the next year or so? Um, I think that, I think whether they're overhyped, I, I don't, I don't want, I don't know if I want to use like that, that term, but I think that in the end of 2021 and early 2022, the amount of games that were were kind of coming across our plate was like extraordinary. It was like nine of every 10 teams I was talking to were building some kind of game of some sort. And I think that um, ultimately I do believe gaming is one of the things that will, you know, will push crypto forward and, and back to kind of the, the UI UX of, great crypto game is cool but you got to crack that nut of like how does the user play the game and not necessarily know or care that it's a, a blockchain they just want to play because it's fun and then you get these collectibles and things along those lines that's what they get solved so i would say that like there's probably some games out there that maybe can't execute or raised at a time where everybody is getting money that uh, when it's like a play to earn sometimes that gets hard it gets hard to, you've seen how some of the projects have just had these like meteoric rises but at some point it starts to, to crash so how do you make that more sustainable how do you create games that um is easy to attract users you don't have to have some like super expensive nft or something to to just get in play um so i would say that the gaming space i think there were a ton of games i could see some of them washing out but ultimately there will be a couple that uh will like really help propel the, the ecosystem forward and probably drive more gaming developers into the space. And um, yeah, so that would probably be the one that I would, I would probably point to. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, you know, I, I grew up playing games like StarCraft, Call of Duty, Diablo, and all, all of these. And they're definitely part pieces of the game that make sense to be on chain, uh, especially like in-game assets, in-game uh, economies. But I think to your point, like we really do have to move away from this play to earn concept to more play because you enjoy, right? And I think the incentives are secondary, but it's it's interesting because like all of these games are driven by token economics, which is great, but I think more focus has to be put on game mechanics, game design, just making us, you know, creating a title that people actually want to play. It doesn't necessarily have to be a AAA title, right? It doesn't need the best graphics. I mean, we saw years ago with Flappy Bird, you don't need this really intricate game to be fun, right? So I, I think there's, what's exciting though, is I was just at East Denver um, and I went to the, the gaming area and I, I it, there's been a lot of progress because I haven't looked at GameFi in quite a while now just because I was yeah. kind of turned off over the last couple of years with all of these kind of Ponzi, Ponzi nomics uh, that were ruling this space, but I think now I see like some real progress in terms of the type of titles that are coming out, the type of gameplay, and even like the multiplayer aspect of these games. Yeah. Oh, totally. Uh, totally. Totally. I think that um, I think that you're right when you mention uh, 
tokenomics that maybe in 2021 made sense or people were like, oh, it's only up. This is going to be amazing. Like, you know, you just, you're going to play to earns the way to go. I, I, I tend to believe that that long-term focusing on value uh, on user capture is really going to be the thing that matters most and not going to be around the token economics. And so I, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm truly interested to see how all of it shakes out. But yeah, I think like focusing on creating a game that doesn't get users to play it because you're getting, you know, some token, but players play it because it's fun to play or there's, you know, game mechanics where they can play against their friends. And, you know, maybe there's NFTs uh, that are plugged into that, that, you know, to get to higher levels or something, maybe you have to buy an NFT or maybe you have to hold something, some kind of NFT. And maybe at some point there is, you know, the ability to have a token integrated there that does something and has utility. And, uh, but, but I, I, yeah, I think, I think totally the teams that are focusing on like, I just want to create a cool game that people want to play, period leaving off crypto, like, I think that's what's going to be impactful because when you can build it again, back to kind of the idea of doing things in crypto, but not necessarily knowing or caring that it's crypto. I think that that's, that's interesting uh, moving forward. Right. Right. All right. So this brings us to the end of our interview. So I'll leave you guys with just one last question. The year 2050, everything's kind of gone according to our plans, right? Web3 dominates the world. What does that future look like? Oh, that's, uh, I mean, it's the one that I think we all are, are hoping for in many ways. Um, I think that, I think that there are going to be a bunch of blockchains running that are going to be specialized. And I'm obviously biased. And again, this is no, uh, oh, I should have said at the beginning, this is no, there's no financial advice, career advice, things along those lines that can get me in trouble. Um, yeah, I think that there's going to be uh, thousands of blockchains that do specific things. And I think that being able to have them connect to one another in a way that um, can move assets seamlessly so that a user, you know, uh, I, I can pick up and go on a trip. Great. Like my tickets can be on a blockchain. They can't be fake. They can't be done. And the loyalty program of that airline has a blockchain doing something where, I can connect to it and, you know, um, those points can be moved between different other loyalty programs that are running on a blockchain. Um, I can go to a different country and when I get there, I can have, you know, whether it's USDC or another, uh, there probably will be some CBDCs out there that, that, that take hold, but being able to get into a native currency easily without going to, you know, ex an exchange at the airport or having to buy you know, buy currency from a bank before I leave. Those are the things that I think will be, will be huge. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, that's, it's more just like daily applicability will be there, but the blockchain piece will be obscured. You will just feel like you're using an application you're comfortable with. You'll have a bank account. It may be a crypto account uh, that you're holding all your crypto in that Maybe you've custodied it with, you know, a bank out there that is now offering crypto custody that uh, you can feel a little more confident in. But I think it's it's it will be every user. It will be touching everything. Um, I'm I'm excited to see what that looks like. But yeah, I just think back to it feels like a, a common theme that we've we've chatted on is is like the obscuring of blockchain technology and powering things that. Users just want to use, not necessarily for, you know, it being crypto, but because it does something better than it can be done traditionally today and making it easier for users. How about you? What do you think, Mark? Yeah, no, no I completely agree. I think the anal analogy I like to use is, you know, does the average user care what hosting service is powering Uber or Lyft or, you know, um, or any of the, the, the daily apps that you use? Uh, the answer is probably no, unless you're, you know, a developer or a big fanatic of the of cloud infrastructure. But you know, similarly, I think blockchain, you know, at the infrastructure level, yeah, it it, it should be obscured. You know, the users should be using the apps because they enjoy it, um, because they get a seamless experience from you know the the platforms that they use. But overall, I think you know, yeah, we'll see infrastructure blockchain kind of fade into the background, uh, still very active, but just from a um, user perspective. Yeah, yeah, cool. 
Cool. Cool. Nate, thanks so much for joining us. If any of our viewers want to learn more about Moonbeam, where should they go? Yeah, moonbeam.network. Uh, they can find us on uh, on Twitter. Uh, all the links should be there. Telegram, all the, the fun places to come interact. Uh, you know, we've got a great community. Um, we're always happy to meet new teams, uh, learn what, what folks are building, um, and help kind of educate folks on connected contracts and some of the, the things that I think will be pretty impactful for teams that are are building today but yeah certainly the easiest place is probably twitter moonbeam uh type in moonbeam network or go to moonbeam.network you can learn more there awesome thanks so much awesome thanks mark thanks for listening to the future x podcast subscribe on spotify or wherever you're listening to this episode